Welcome to everyone. Thank you all for attending this evening's Janus Forum lecture event sponsored by the Political Theory Project here at Brown University. My name is Daniel D'Amico. I'm the Associate Director of the Political Theory Project. Um, I'd like to begin with a brief description of what the PTP is and our unique vision behind the Janus Forum program, such as tonight. Our mission at the PTP is to invigorate the study of ideas and institutions that make societies free, prosperous, and fair. Furthermore, we aim for all of our programming to promote interdisciplinary methods and viewpoint diversity. But what does that mean? Perhaps no program of ours better showcases this mission than the Janus Forum events like this one. In short, we seek to bring together scholars with sub substantially different ways of looking at the world to discuss critically some of the most pressing social issues of our time. The Janus Forum provides an event space where members of the Brown community can view and engage with alternative intellectual perspectives by top scholars and in direct comparison with one another. When designing Janus events, we simply try to think of two established members of the academic profession whose research and conclusions represent tangibly different outlooks about the world. Very smart and very well-informed people can often see the world in very different ways. Tonight's conversation is centered on the question, is humanity progressing? And we are joined by Professors Steven Pinker and Paul Krugman. The format for tonight's event is straightforward. Each, pre each presenter, beginning with Professor Pinker, will discuss the motivations and findings of their work for approximately 20 minutes. Following both presentations, they'll be uh, afforded about 15 minutes to directly engage with one another, and we'll conclude with direct questions and answers from the audience. Now I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Steven Pinker is an experimental psychologist who conducts research in visual cognition, psycholinguistics, and social relations. He is currently the John Stone Professor of Psychology at Harvard University and has also taught at Stanford and MIT. He is the author of several best-selling books, including The Better Angels of Our Nature, and his most recent, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. Please join me in welcoming Professor Steven Pinker. Thank you very much. Is humanity progressing? Well, that depends on what you mean by progress, but that turns out to be, I think, a surprisingly easy question to answer. Namely, progress consists of improvements in human flourishing. Human well-being can be measured. Life, health, sustenance, prosperity, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness. If they have increased over time, I submit, that would be progress. Well, let's go to the data. Beginning with the most precious thing of all, life. For most of human existence, life expectancy at birth hovered around 30 years of age. But then, starting in the 19th century with advances in uh, sanitation, vaccination, and other uh, developments in public health and medicine, life expectancy has increased so that today, worldwide, it is 71 years. Virtually no one knows that it is that high. In the richer countries of the world, uh, more than 80 years. But every region of the world has shown substantial improvement so that the life expectancy in sub-Saharan Africa t today is uh, what it was uh, when my grandparents were growing up in Europe uh, a century ago. For most of human history, the uh, biggest source of low life expectancy was the mortality of children, the most vulnerable members of our species. Even in a developed country like Sweden 250 years ago, one third of children did not live to see their fifth birthday. Sweden brought its rate of child mortality uh, down by a factor of uh, 100. And every region of the world has followed uh, suit, such as in North America, Canada, in uh, East Asia, South Korea, in Latin America, Chile, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, Ethiopia, which has brought its rate down from 30%, uh, 25% uh, uh, 30 years ago to 6% today. Uh, still too high, but the progress is continuing. Mothers, too, were in mortal danger when they gave birth. Uh, 250 years ago, about 1% of Swedish mothers died in childbirth. Uh, that was have been has been reduced by a factor of 250, as it has in the United States, Malaysia, uh, and Ethiopia. Sustenance, 
humanity has, for most of its history, been unable to feed itself. Famine was one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but starting with the British agricultural revolution in the 18th century, uh, the, uh, all of the developed countries have um, acquired the ability to feed themselves. Uh, this would be a dubious accomplishment if all those extra calories were just making people fatter, but in fact, they have reduced the rate of undernourishment throughout the world. Uh, in 1970, about 35% of people in the developing world were undernourished. That has fallen to less than 15%, starting in Latin America, then in uh, Asia, and now in Sub-Saharan Africa. As a result, famine, which used to strike any part of the world, wreaking massive uh, devastation, now is confined to only the most remote and war-torn regions. And it's a matter not of the world's inability to grow enough food, but to get it to uh, the places where it's needed. Prosperity. For most of human history, there was uh, pretty much no economic growth to speak of until the Industrial Revolution. This graph shows that the gross world product for most of human history was less than one pixel high before increasing by a factor of about uh, 200, uh, beginning with the Industrial Revolution. Now, again, this would be a dubious uh, example of progress if all of the gains uh, were going to the proverbial 1%. But in fact, uh, as a result, the rate of extreme poverty is being decimated. 200 years ago, by the current standard of extreme poverty extrapolated backwards, one could say that 90% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty, $1.90 per person per day. Uh, now, uh, that, that, uh, it's less than 9% of the world that lives in extreme poverty. And in fact, there's been a 75% reduction in extreme poverty just in the last 30 years, virtually no one uh, knows about it. Uh, within rich countries, there has been increased attention to the plight of the, uh, the needy, whereas 150 years ago, rich countries devoted about 1.5% of their GDP towards social redistribution to children, to the elderly, to the sick, uh, to the poor. In the 20th century, every developed country went on a program of social spending, so that today the median OECD country uh, redistributes 22% of its um, uh, gross domestic product to social spending. Peace. For most of human history, the natural state of relations between states and empires was war, and uh, peace was merely a brief interlude between wars. Today, wars between great powers, the 800-pound gorillas on the world stage, has pretty much ceased to exist. The last Great Power War pitted the United States against China in uh, Korea more than 65 years ago. And uh, since 1946, after the uh, disaster of the Second World War, uh, even in the 1940s, the rate of death in battle worldwide was about uh, 20 per 100,000 per year. That has fallen to less than one per 100,000 uh, per year. And Great Power Wars, indeed wars between nations, uh, appear to be uh, obsolescence. Freedom and rights. We've all read with uh, alarm about the erosion of democracy in countries like Russia and Venezuela and uh, Turkey. Nonetheless, if you <coughs> count up the number of uh, countries that are democratic or autocratic, scaled by how democratic or autocratic they are, <coughs> you see that the world has never been more democratic than it has been in the um, this decade, a majority of countries are more democratic than autocratic, a majority of people live in countries that are more democratic than autocratic. Also, the power of states to brutalize their citizens has been um, unevenly but, but uh, steadily reduced. In, uh, through most of the history of states and empires, justice was uh, meted out by uh, cruel punishments like breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, clawing with iron hooks, uh, sawing in half, and uh, impalement. Uh, but then, beginning with the Enlightenment in the 18th century, country after country abolished the use of uh, grisly, uh, sadistic torture as a means of criminal punishment, including the United States with the Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment, which occurred pretty much in the, in the uh, middle of this process. Countries have been <coughs> abolishing the death penalty, which used to be ubiquitous, um, and if current trends continue, uh, which they probably won't, but if you extrapolated the line, capital punishment will have vanished from the face of the earth by the year 2026. Country after country has decriminalized homosexuality, including just in the last few months, India, Lebanon, and Trinidad, and uh, Tobago. 
a process that also uh, began for the first time in history around the end of the 18th century with the Enlightenment. Other abolitions that began around the time of the Enlightenment include witch hunts, religious persecution like burning heretics, dueling among men of honor, blood sports like bear baiting, uh, debtor's prisons, and most famously of all, slavery. Slavery used to be legal everywhere on earth. No one seemed to think there was anything wrong with it. The Bible had no problem with slavery. So-called democratic Athens was a slaveholding society. But beginning with the end of the 18th century, there was a trickle of aboli abolitions that then grew into a flood, which uh, has recently encompassed the entire earth as of 1980, when Mauritania abolished legal slavery. So for the first time in human history, slavery is illegal everywhere on earth. On a smaller scale, uh, the uh, institutionalized violence against racial and ethnic minorities has been in decline, although uh, tragically not to zero. In the United States, lynchings used to occur at a rate of about three a week, 150 a year, uh, and that, that has uh, fallen to zero. And the kind of racist attitudes that have underlain uh, violence against minorities have been in decline. Uh, the uh, opinion polls that ask people, do you think, for example, black and white students should go to separate schools, or would you move out if a black family moved in next door, have declined to the range of uh, crank opinion. And my uh, colleague, uh, Mazarin Banaji, with her student Tessa Charlesworth, has shown that more uh, implicit measures of racism, the kinds of things that people don't necessarily confess to, but that you can detect via uh, unobtrusive measures have been in steady decline since she first started measuring it in the uh, turn of the millennium. This is not just an American phenomenon, but a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, it used to be that, that uh, more countries had apartheid or Jim Crow laws that discriminated against ethnic minorities than, that, than uh, policies like affirmative action that favored uh, their ethnic minorities. Uh, as of the uh, 1990s, the situation has been reversed. And hard as it may be to believe, uh, but worldwide, uh, the uh, liberal values have been uh, increasing. That is, tolerance of homosexuality, belief in equal rights for, uh, for women, belief in democracy. Uh, obviously, most dramatically in um, Western Europe, but also in uh, Southern Europe, in the Americas, in Eastern Europe, in the former USSR, Latin America, East Asia, South, e South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Islamic Middle East and North Africa. Uh, there are obviously still big differences between endorsement of liberal values across the world's regions. But amazingly, uh, among cohorts of younger people, people in the um, Islamic Middle East and North Africa today are more liberal than their counterparts in Sweden were in 1960. Unless that seem incredible, you could uh, imagine that a young person in Egypt today could very well uh, recognize the uh, value of gay marriage. If you would ask that of a typical Swede in 1960, they would have thought you were crazy. Children's rights. For most of human history, children were set to work in farms and factories. In 1850, as any reader of Charles Dickens uh, would appreciate, about 30% of children uh, worked, and that fell to um, single digits in England and the United States by the 20th century, and in other countries like Italy. Worldwide, also, child labor is in decline. Within the United States, the victimization of children, such as violent victimization at school, including bullying, has been in decline, and physical abuse and sexual abuse by caregivers. Indeed, violent crime in general has been in uh, historic decline in any region of the world that exists in a state of anarchy. There will be violent predation, often followed by uh, vendettas and blood feuds. In medieval Europe, for example, the homicide rate was about uh, 35 per 100,000 per year. Then with the consolidation of medieval kingdoms out of the feudal um, patchwork, uh, the homicide rate in every European country fell to about one per 100,000 per year. That was re that's replicated in any part of the world in which frontier regions are brought under the control of the rule of law. Happened again in colonial New England, happened in the American Wild West. And even parts of the world that uh, remain highly violent today, such as uh, Central America um, and uh, Mexico, uh, were five times as violent a century ago. Uh, on a smaller scale within the United States, violence against women has been in decline, including uh, domestic violence against wives and girlfriends and rates of rape and sexual assault. Uh, knowledge. 
the natural state of humanity is illiteracy and ignorance. And for most of human history, literacy was a privilege of a uh, wealthy or um, uh, priestly uh, uh, caste. But um, basic education, which 200 years ago was a privilege that went to less than a fifth of the world's population, is now enjoyed by more than 80% of the world's population, 90% of the world's population under the age of 25. Uh, it has happened uh, unevenly across the world's surface, but every region has shown uh, spectacular gains. Uh, and not just men, but women. Whereas 250 years ago, only six British women could read and write for every 10 men who could, the uh, industrialized countries achieved gender parity and literacy by the end of the 19th century. And the world is very, very close to gender parity in basic literacy. Even the most backward regions, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, have shown progress in getting girls into school. And perhaps the most astonishing, incredible, difficult to believe example of progress that I have come across, we have been getting smarter. This is true. In a well-documented phenomenon known as the Flynn effect, IQ scores have been increasing all over the world by about three points a decade for uh, about a century. Okay, do any of these forms of uh, progress, the kinds of things that economists like to measure, actually improve the quality of our lives? Well, in many ways they do. For example, 150 years ago, the typical work week in the United States and Europe was 62 hours. That has fallen to less than uh, 40. And because of the uh, universal penetration of running water and electricity, and the widespread adoption of labor-saving devices like washing machines, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, dishwashers, stoves, and microwaves, the amount of our lives that we forfeit to housework, which people indicate is their least favorite way of spending their time, uh, has fallen from more than 60 hours a week to fewer than 15 hours a week. Thanks to the shortening work week and the uh, smaller amount of our lives that we waste on housework, the amount of leisure time has uh, increased over the last 50 years, both for men and for women. Uh, the reason that it has leveled off for women is that women today spend more, much more time with their children. A uh, single working woman today spends more time with her children than a married stay-at-home mom did in the 1950s. Okay, does it make us any happier? Uh, and the answer is it almost certainly does. There is a, a well-known uh, well relationship between life satisfaction and uh, income, GDP per capita. It is, this, this is plotted on a logarithmic axis, it must be noted, uh, since obviously an extra dollar uh, improves the happiness of a poor person much more than the happiness of a rich person. But it is a relationship that holds across countries and each arrow impaling a dot uh, represents the population within a country, so richer countries are happier, richer people within countries are happier. You'd expect that as, as the world gets richer, its people ought to get happier. And in general, that seems to be true, as best we can tell from longitudinal data. Uh, in 71% of countries for which we have happiness data over time, uh, happiness has increased. Uh, interestingly, the United States is not one of them. Uh, happiness has declined a bit in the United States, but the United States was a pretty happy country to start with. And contrary to a, uh, a widespread urban legend that the world is getting more suicidal, the exact opposite is the case. Suicide rates have declined by about 40% worldwide, but once again, the United States is something of an outlier of this trend. Our suicide rate has been creeping up since its low point around 1999. Okay, well, I hope to <clears throat> have uh, persuaded you that progress is not a question of optimism. It's not a question of wearing rose-colored glasses. It's not a question of seeing the half glass as half full. It is a demonstrable, empirical fact about human history. So let me wrap up with three questions about progress that I suspect have occurred to many of you. First is, well, what caused it? Uh, the universe does not contain any force that lifts humanity ever upward. Quite the contrary, uh, there are a number of forces in the universe, such as the second law of thermodynamics, such as the laws of evolution, that pretty much grind us down. But uh, in Enlightenment Now, I make the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress. Namely, the reason that we have been able to claw back at the processes of entropy and evolution is because of the development of reason, science, and humanism. Now, you might say, is that really an, uh, an explanation? I mean, doesn't everyone believe in reason, science, and humanism? What else could it be? Well, there are alternatives to, uh, to, to humanism, such as religious morality, 
uh, such as authoritarian nationalism and populism. And I uh, don't have time to go, go, go into this, but in uh, many ways, the forces of populism are pushing back against pretty much every one of the drivers of progress that, that I've been trying to uh, document. Reactionary ideologies that try to wrench society backwards, and utopian, romantic, and messianic ideologies that imagine a world in which everything will be perfect. Second question that, that people often raise, uh, not perhaps quite so bluntly, is that even if there has been progress, are we better off denying it to prevent complacency, people uh, falling back into complacency? And I, I would argue no. <laughs> We're best off with an understanding of the world that is accurate. Of course, we must be aware of danger, suffering, and injustice wherever they occur. But it's important to be aware of how they can be reduced. Because even if there are dangers in complacency, there are also dangers in thoughtless pessimism. One of them is fatalism. If you really believe that everything is getting worse and worse, despite all of the efforts of humanity to make the world a better place, well, why waste time and money on a hopeless cause? As, uh, as Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. And if you're convinced that we're doomed, that if climate change doesn't do us in, then runaway artificial intelligence will, then the rational response is, well, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Why even uh, bother? The other danger to thoughtless pessimism is radicalism. If you think that all of our institutions are failing and beyond all hopes for reform, you'll be receptive to calls to smash the machine, drain the swamp, burn the empire to the ground, or to uh, aspiring leaders who promise only I can fix it. Third uh, question, is progress inevitable? And the answer is, of course not. Progress does not mean that everything becomes better for everyone, everywhere, all the time. That would not be progress. That would be a miracle. And progress is not a miracle. Progress consists of using knowledge to solve problems. Problems are inevitable, and solutions create new problems that must be solved in their uh, turn. So the existence of problems today, and Lord knows we have many of them, does not mean there has been no progress, because the problems of yesterday were, in, uh, in almost every case, worse. Uh, as Franklin Pierce Adams said, nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory. Uh, progress, I suggest, can continue if we remain committed to reason, science, and humanism. And if we don't, it won't. Thank you. Our second presenter this, this evening is Paul Krugman, who is professor of economics and distinguished scholar at the Graduate Center's Luxembourg Income Study Center at City University of New York. Previously, he was a professor of economics at Princeton University. Uh, in addition to the Nobel Prize, uh, Professor Krugman's economic research has garnered him the John Bates Clark Award, as well as many other prestigious uh, accredits. His latest books include End This Depression Now, The Conscience of a Liberal, the Great Unraveling, and several others speak directly to tonight's topic of humanity's progress and or lack thereof. Please join me in welcoming Professor Paul Krugman. Okay, so um, in some ways I'm picking up uh, where Stephen Pinker left off. And um, I would actually maybe uh, even dispute a little bit the question uh, that is the theme of this forum, because the question, is humanity progressing? Um, I think really are two different questions. One is, uh, have we progressed? Uh, to which the answer is yes, of course. Uh, the second is, will we continue to progress? And that's uh, where I get worried. Um, and the, um, and I, uh, Steve Pinker gave us a whole lot of measures, and I, which are interesting, I think fascinating. Um, I would, I have a kind of an omnibus, simplified way of thinking of it all, um, which is I, I, I would apply the Rawls test. I think probably a lot of people have read John Rawls' Theory of Justice, and, and Rawls had this uh, brilliantly simplifying conceptual idea that the way you should decide how, what kind of society should we have is to ask 
Imagine yourself to be someone making a decision about what kind of society we're going to have without knowing who in that society you would be. Imagine this hypothetical state behind the veil of ignorance where you have to decide on the structure of a society. Uh, and it has to be one that reflects the realities that after the society is created, people will know who they are and incentives will matter and people won't be angels and so on. And that, that, that this is a way to think about what justice is. And, it's, uh, uh, and I think many people uh, are at some level Rawlsians, or at least partial Rawlsians. Uh, um, and, but while Rawls was thinking about the design of a society, it's also a way of assessing the state of, of a society. Uh, and if you do the Rawls test and ask yourself not what kind of society would you design, but what era would you choose to be born into? Which period in human history uh, would you choose to have to be born into if you had to make that choice without knowing which person you would be with that era. Clearly, the early 21st century is the time you would choose. Uh, it's a time when, uh, by almost every measure, uh, life is better. Uh, the, uh, it's a time when, uh, actually in, in, in many ways, by the way, if you think of yourself as an anonymous human being, uh, ex ante, uh, trying to choose um, the things that would be most uh, encouraging the things that would really uh, make you say that that now is the time to be to be alive uh, would be the enormous economic progress that's been made in developing countries. It's the it's the rise of China and India uh, that have uh, meant that billions of people who previously lived lives of, of great desperation live now lives that are a lot closer to. To, to decency, but there are lots of other things. In fact, you know, I, if I could trade places with, uh, with Louis XIV, I wouldn't do it because uh, you know, he didn't have modern medicine and, uh, or decent coffee. Um, and, um, uh, however, uh, that's kind of not the, uh, from my point of view, that's not the interesting question. The question is how much can we count on future years being as clearly better than the distant past as current, this, the current situation is. Um, and what you see once you start to look at things is that there have been, although the clear, the trend over the very long run has been clearly upwards, uh, there have been a lot of episodes of retrogression, that there are times when things do move backwards. And I'm gonna start with one that at some level is really not very important, but happens to be something that I really know about. Uh, it's it's where, where I actually do know uh, the thing I'm talking about, which is, uh, is globalization, the global economy. Uh, now, globalization is, is not actually an inherently a good thing, although by and large it has been, and it's certainly a very important factor in the rise of the, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the emerging nation middle class. Um, but it's certainly something where you might expect uh, that it would progress, the technology. Uh, the technology of, of international commerce, of international communication, keeps getting better. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a really decisive point when a global economy became possible based upon the technology of the steam engine and the telegraph, uh, but it's continued to progress, and you would think that therefore, clearly the world must have been, you know, uh, we, the world must be uh, ever uh, continually becoming a smaller place, a more integrated place. Uh, but if you do international economics at all, you know that that's not true. This is, uh, so we have reasonable numbers on the share of trade, uh, imports plus exports in world GDP. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, slight uh, disconnect between two different data sources, but they, they, they basically agree. Uh, um, and there was a big rise in world trade between 1870 and the eve of World War I, uh, made possible by steamships and railroads and uh, submarine telegraphs and, uh, and canals uh, and so forth, um, which then went into reverse. And there was a long period uh, when trade became much less than it had been before. There was a, a long period when the world became bigger, if you like, or the world became less flat, or whatever your, your preferred metaphor is. Uh, when, when national economies became more disjoint uh, from each other. 
Um, and what that was about was uh, fundamentally politics and the things that people do in the name of politics. Uh, they, there was a lot of protectionism, um, and then there were things that, are, you know, protectionism is bad, U-boats sinking, merchant ships is worse. Uh, so world trade uh, came apart. Um, and then it was reconstructed. And there's this long period of rising world trade that begins after World War II, which is a, it's a political construct. To get there required a, actually it's the most successful example of international diplomacy uh, in world history. The, the world trading system that we created, a rules-based system in which countries negotiate uh, reductions in barriers, make uh, greater integration possible, but also and set rules about deviations. So it's not a completely rigid system, but it's a system that 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 uh, makes it hard to backtrack. If uh, I used to sometimes say it's, it's levers and ratchets, you move things up, but then you have things to keep them from sliding back. Um, and so you had this gradual reconstruction, gradual. We didn't really get back to the level of global integration that we had in 1913 until sometime in the 1980s. It took a long, long time to get back to the, if you ever, if John Maynard Keynes' first uh, famous book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, begins with this nostalgic uh, vision of the world as it seemed to be on the eve of World War I, where the English gentleman ordering uh, breakfast in bed could, uh, could pick up his telephone and order products from all over the world and, and how that had gone away. And now, now we're back, and it's better because you can do it on your, on your smartphone, but uh, it took us a long, long time to get there. Now you have a, a takeoff at the end, which is the hyper-globalization, uh, which is something yet again that's new. It's the, and uh, not worth going too far into that. Um, but all of this was made possible by a, pro a quite difficult process of political progress. Um, and it's a process that's very much actually in doubt as we speak. Uh, I spent last night at a symposium on the state of the world trading system. Uh, and we only read the actual, you know, so we've had a bunch of uh, Trump tariffs and retaliatory tariffs and so on. Um, quantitatively, they don't add up to very much yet in spite of, they're not small numbers, but it's a big world out there. Um, but the collapse of norms has been spectacular. All of the rules that we thought bound countries appear, when, when you have a situation where the United States is going to limit imports of steel from Canada on the grounds of protecting national security, which is what we just did, uh, Canada. Uh, this is going to be a, uh, we, we've, we've seen that the norms that sustained that period of progress are in great danger. Now this is a, you know, trade is what I studied in my life, but it's, it's, uh, it's not the most important thing in the world. Um, so, okay, other retrogressions. Uh, the world made a lot of economic progress between uh, uh, the mid-19th century and the eve of World War I. Uh, and then stuff happened. So, okay, uh, it's Germany, uh, uh, real GDP per capita as best we can estimate. Uh, and uh, uh, it was, you know, by the end of the Weimar Republic, they had barely gotten back to where they were on the eve of World War I. Uh, they did make, actually, unfortunately, uh, sad to say, a lot of economic growth uh, under the Nazis, uh, although not much of it went for consumer goods. Uh, and then, well, um, being destroyed in a war uh, can do a lot. And though Germany is now famed for its, um, uh, for, for the uh, you know, speed of the recovery after World War II, you know, as of 1951, uh, so, you know, almost 40 years after the beginning of, uh, of World War I, uh, Germany was, in, e even by this measure, you know, barely better off in material terms, and no doubt a large numbers of individual Germans worse off in material terms than they had been. So this is a pretty extended period of retrogression. Um, other examples of retrogression. Um, the, uh, oh, look, one of the things, uh, I, I'm old enough to have spent a large part of my life uh, facing, you know, uh, Cold War and and uh, and thinking about nuclear war and and all of that, and uh, uh, it didn't happen. And there was a true uh, 
you know, miraculous political development with the abrupt collapse uh, of communism. Um, that abrupt collapse of communism brought uh, a lot of liberty to a lot of people. It also brought an amazing amount of social uh, and economic collapse to the, the former Soviet empire. Um, here's Russian life expectancy. Um, uh, things really went to hell with the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, I, I, I haven't done, I'm not a scholar on this. I don't know exactly what the, uh, the breakdown of the causes of increased mortality is, although you can make some guesses. And we, we've actually been, been some you know, uh, amazing and kind of scary work about the problems that we're having in parts of America now. There's a whole, there's a belt of, uh, of rising mortality and declining life expectancy, and, uh, and Anne Case and Angus Deaton, who've been documenting it, are, are saying it's, it's uh, deaths of despair. It's uh, suicide, alcohol, and opioids. Uh, well, a whole lot of deaths of despair, probably uh, uh, fewer opioids and more vodka, but still, it was a, uh, this was a, what well, actually, it's only in the last few years that, that, uh, that Russia has gotten back to the life expectancy it had at, in, in the closing years of, of the communist regime. So that's, an, again, it's a pretty extended period of retrogression. Um, all right, I'll give you an example that's closer to home and actually is a, uh, is a happy story now, but only for now. And so, um, uh, so, uh, where I now live. Um, it's a great time now to live in New York if you can afford a place, which is the problem. But anyway, the, uh, but uh, housing costs aside, uh, um, but uh, there, was a, there was a period when things really, the social order really did break down uh, to a very important extent. If we did go from being a, from a city that was pretty safe, was never, you know, never completely uh, violence-free, but it was a pretty safe place in, in, the, in the early 1960s, it became an extremely, well, maybe not by the standards of the Middle Ages uh, or, 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 or Stone Age societies, but by modern standards, New York became a very dangerous place. Uh, and um, peaking in the 1980s, uh, and it, there were a lot, it, there was some real, there was a real sense in which uh, life in New York for lots of people became a lot worse. Uh, and there was a period you know, when, when uh, uh, dystopian uh, uh, books and, and movies, Escape from New York, that sort of thing was, was staring. And that, was not, that wasn't coming out of nowhere. That wasn't a fantasy. That was driven by what seemed to be the very real collapse of social order in, in America's greatest city. Uh, now, that has turned around. And these days, New York is once again a very safe place, and so a few months ago, when the the battery um, in the smoke alarm uh, went dead, uh, uh, causing it to beep, which uh, in always happens at three in the morning, um, and it turned out I did not have a spare battery in the drawer. Um, uh, I went out on Broadway at three in the morning, and there were people around, and it was perfectly fine. So, uh, so right now, New York is is once again. A, not a perfectly safe, but a remarkably safe, livable place to be. And so you ask, what did we do? What, why did things go so wrong, and what did we do? Why, what, what made them go right again? And then the, there's been a great deal of research, and I think the answer with fairly high degree of confidence is we have no idea. Uh, <laughs> that there are various kinds of their interesting stories of all kinds, but fundamentally we don't know why things got so much worse, and we certainly don't know why things got so much better, which means that, of course, if they were to get worse again, uh, it's not as if we know what the answer is to, to make them better. So, so things go backwards. It, extended periods of retrogression are, in fact, a quite common feature of, of history. Um, now, uh, so far, uh, all of the setbacks to progress uh, have turned out to be temporary. Um, so far, all the setbacks have been temporary. Okay, um, that, if you're wondering, is a bust of Marcus Aurelius, uh, the Roman emperor best known nowadays 
for the fact that uh, Russell Crowe killed his son in the arena, but, uh, uh, but previously best known as the, the emperor who was also a philosopher. Um, um, so let me tell you a little bit about pre-industrial, uh, about ancient Rome and pre-industrial economics. It turns out we've been learning stuff about that. Uh, the basic view, which is, is, uh, is, is still basically right, is that the pre-industrial world was Malthusianism. That um, uh, technological progress was slow, real but slow, population always pressed upon resources, uh, and so um, over time, living standards always tended to be driven down to the edge of subsistence. So that uh, uh, while the, the range of civilization, the, the area covered by civilization grew over time, it reached new places, uh, the standard of living of the ordinary person uh, did not show any sustained improvement. Uh, the, the subjects of Louis XIV uh, probably lived no better overall than the ancient Sumerians did. So that's the, the long story is that, that pre-industrial societies were, were static in terms of, static and poor in, uh, in terms of their standard of living. Um, and I think until fairly recently, we would have thought of, of uh, ancient Rome as fitting right into all of that, 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 the, uh, that the rise of the Roman Empire was a political thing, Somebody managed to create a unified uh, regime, uh, but otherwise was still basically in that mold. And that's still largely right. That is, uh, there was no industrial revolution in ancient Rome. Uh, but there's an increasing amount of evidence now that says that there was actually pretty substantial real economic progress during the heyday of the Roman Empire. Uh, and you have various kinds of evidence. You have evidence, we, we know what people were, we know what ordinary working people were eating, because we, uh, we can do, you know, uh, uh, anal uh, analyses now that, that show what was in their diet, and there was a, there was a lot more uh, meat and, and fish. There was a lot more protein in there than you might have expected. Uh, we have uh, pretty good estimates of urbanization rates. And what all this, is, if you, you know, if if anybody still reads uh, Edward Gibbon and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, it opens with this passage about how the happiest era in the history of humanity was the two centuries of, of the, the good emperors. Um, not entirely wrong. Um, it's a, not actually probably true uh, at the time he was writing. Uh, Malthus, by the way, uh, you know, Malthus gets a bad name now, but Malthus was right about uh, all of human history up until Malthus wrote, which is not an accident because Malthus is a product of the Enlightenment, which produces all of this breakaway uh, progress that we've seen since then. But, but ancient Rome was, uh, appears to have been a fairly extended, uh, fairly substantial excursion from that Malthusian baseline. It was, in fact, a substantially wealthier society than the typical pre-industrial society, and in particular Italy, the heart of the empire, as best we can tell, and it's, it's all of this is inference based upon indirect evidence, but as best we can tell, Italy in the first and second centuries AD uh, probably had a material standard of living that would not be achieved again until, let's say, the Dutch Republic of the 17th century. It really was the highest, uh, that, that uh, peak of, of, of economic performance that, that, uh, that humanity had managed to achieve, and it would not be equal for a very, very long time. Okay, now, suppose you were a Roman, an uh, educated Roman living uh, late in the reign of Marcus Aurelius, and uh, you went to attend a TED talk, uh, which isn't as much of a joke as it sounds like because, in fact, listening to esteemed orators deliver uh, speeches was a, a form of recreation for the Roman elite. So you went to a, a TED talk, um, and somebody, and the orator would explain to you that if you look at all of the indicators that we have about the, the past two centuries, they show progress. Uh, we have peace, you know, we have occasional wars with, uh, with 
barbarians and Parthians and whatever, and, and occasional civil strife and occasional crazy uh, rebellions by, by those people in Judea and whatever. But, the, uh, uh, but by and large, we have peace. Um, crime is pretty low because we, we have policing banditry pretty well. The, the sea lanes across the Mediterranean are safe and visibly can just see it. Prosperity has been rising, things have been better. So although there have been bad stretches, so far all the setbacks have been temporary. And of course, uh, I, I guess we should blame Russell Crowe now, but anyway, the, uh, the, everything fell apart, in fact, with, uh, with the death of Marcus Aurelius. There was a period of troubles, civil war, strife, uh, plagues as well. But the, the Roman Empire went through a very bad period. It was reconstructed eventually, uh, really about a century later, uh, but the new Roman Empire, the Diocletian, was, uh, was harsher, meaner, more violent, more militaristic, and poorer than the, the Rome that had existed before. And in the Western Roman Empire, it only lasted for, well, only lasted for, you know, still uh, generations, but in, in the end did in fact give way to, uh, to barbarism. So that this is a, this is a, a case of retrogression on a grand scale. And, and, and as I've been saying, it's probably, uh, uh, it was probably around um, 13 or 1400 years before, in, in economic terms, uh, anybody managed to reach the level of development that, that Rome had achieved during the reign of Marcus Aurelius. So bad things happen, and they happen for extended periods of time. So here we are now. Uh, the progress we've achieved is a lot bigger than the progress that Rome achieved uh, under the emperors. Uh, um, in duration, it's not clear it's that much longer. I mean, it, from a global point of view, things really turn around. I guess it depends on which measure you use. But it's, it's uh, uh, certainly it, the world in 1700 was not dramatically uh, free from the Malthusian trap. Even in 1800, only pieces of it were. So it's uh, so what we really are talking about. We're talking about a couple of centuries, maybe a bit more, of progress. Do we know that that progress is going to continue? And the answer, of course, is that we don't. And there are a whole series of reasons to be worried. Uh, there's uh, uh, climate change above all. And climate change is, is scary, and 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 it's coming. And the and the uh, so far, it actually requires an enormous leap of optimism to believe that we will deal with it before before it's catastrophic. Um, but other things as well. I and mean, there there are many things. I mean, uh, I think even 15 years ago, if you had suggested that actual fascists would once again be a significant factor on the political scene in in the West people would not have taken you seriously, and yet there they are. Um, income inequality, which is where what's actually studied at the Stone Center, I'm obliged to, to, uh, to mention our, our benefactor uh, when I talk about where I sit. Um, the um, uh, inequality has clearly increased enormously. Now, whether how much actual decline in living standards there's been uh, f even for people at the bottom is something that you could, is actually depends on your data, but that in itself is telling you that it, it depends on how you measure it. Uh, but again, want to think of all those things. If, if, if someone had told you, certainly when, when I was uh, growing up, if somebody had told you in, in the 1960s that, a, uh, that, that what uh, uh, Thomas Piketty calls patrimonial capitalism, a society dominated by a tiny wealthy elite, much of whose wealth is inherited, would be making a comeback. You would have thought they were crazy, and yet there's a lot of reason to think that that is in fact where we're going. So things can go very, very wrong. Uh, the fact of, of progress uh, is real. Um, the chances that it will in fact go into reverse uh, also seem alarmingly large. Um, and yes, I think fatalism is a, is a really bad thing, but complacency is, is also a really bad thing. We, we can screw this up uh, massively, and there's a pretty good chance that we will. Thanks.
So I wanted to afford you both a, a significant portion of time to, for some degree of direct interaction. So uh, having the second word, so to speak, thus far, uh, Professor Pinker, if you had any direct questions for Professor Krugman. Uh, well, I don't know if it's a direct question so much as it is a uh, perhaps reframing the, the premises that brought us here, because I know I, I can see from the slides of the various uh, odd couples that you've had in previous Janus events and from some of the buildup that, that you're, uh, indeed, the introductions to us that, uh, uh, that you're kind of setting this up as a major um, debate or disagreement. And uh, as far as I can tell, there really isn't one, because uh, certainly, uh, as I... I uh, have insisted in both my books on progress. The idea of progress does not mean that nothing can ever go wrong again. Uh, in other words, that wouldn't be progress. That, that would be a miracle. And that's just not the way the universe works. It's not the way progress works. Uh, and indeed, every one of the regressions that, uh, that Paul mentioned, I, I discuss in some detail in Enlightenment Now and in uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature. And there have been other regressions, such as the uh, Spanish flu epidemic in uh, the uh, closing uh, months of World War I, where life expectancy went down by, uh, by a lot. Um, AIDS in Africa, uh, if, if some of you may have spotted the, in the life expectancy curve in Africa, there was a, uh, a dip, a pretty substantial one, although uh, as with indeed all of the, the regressions, uh, there was not only recovery, but, uh, but um, soaring progress after it. It doesn't mean that every reversal uh, will be temporary. Again, that would be, that would be mysticism. I mean, there's just no, in, in asking the question, has there been progress and how do we continue it? That should not, that must not be equated with the question of have problems been permanently abolished? Is regression uh, now impossible? Of course it's possible. There's lots of reasons why we could have regression, uh, including, the, uh, as I mentioned, the forces of evolution and entropy, which are always pushing back. So um, the question is, are we now at a point in which uh, we should expect things to go, to go backwards? Um, and the obvious answer is we don't know. Uh, the, uh, I think both Paul and I are uh, terrified that some of the forces of authoritarian populism are systematically uh, set in opposition to many of the forces that have driven this progress, such as international cooperation, such as reliance on scientific data as opposed to uh, ideology, such as um, uh, uh, intelligent, uh, social spending. Uh, all of the drivers of the progress are very much threatened, and the, I guess the question is, uh, are the um, more f fearful developments of the, the last few years, do they represent the future? Are we at a, at a turning point in history? As, by the way, every generation believes it to be, that uh, if you go back, no matter what the level of progress or advancement uh, was there are always prophets saying, well, things have been good so far, but uh, just you wait, they are. We're on the edge of a precipice. Uh, we've been uh, uh, enjoying the, the, uh, the view f f after jumping off a building. So far, so good, uh, but c catastrophe is about to happen. So, and it is true, it could happen. Uh, the question of will it happen, are we now at the turning point in history that has constantly been predicted uh, is, uh, impossible to say for sure, but there are certain things that I think we can look at to try to uh, decide whether we should all take poison and uh, be done with it, uh, or whether there are uh, uh, actually reasons to believe that some of the, that we will solve the problems facing us in the way that previous generations uh, solve the problems facing them. In terms of authoritarian populism, which I, you know, I agree terrifies me as much as it, as it does Paul, there are some demographic trends that are uh, pushing back, or that will be expected to push back over the longer term, including uh, urbanization. The support for authoritarian populists tends to come from rural uh, and exurban areas, and the world is urbanizing, including education. The uh, support for, for populism comes from less educated segments of the population, and the world is getting more uh, educated. And just uh, generational turnover. The supporters of authoritarian populism tend to be baby boomers and silent generation uh, members. The Gen X, Millennium, and uh, iGen are much less supportive. People tend to keep their political uh, orientation as they age. It's not true that everyone gets more conservative when they go, uh, grow older. So at least these are not guarantees, but they are kind of forces that uh, suggest that, that uh, Trumpism is not uh, a, a permanent future.
Yeah, I, I mean, again, it's uh, to a certain extent, this is going to turn into the Monty Python sketch about having an argument. You know, uh, trying to have an argument. I'm not sure we have one, but uh, um, in in uh, I, I mean, uh, let me put it this way: uh, the in terms of my Rawlsian notion of progress, uh, uh, the way I would put it is uh, how how highly should we rate the possibility that uh, a, a behind a future veil of ignorance, knowing you know, the, the history of the next couple of generations, that someone given the choice between uh, being born into the world in 2050 as opposed to being born into the world in 1990 would say, oh, I'll take 1990, thank you. That was a, that was, those were the good times. And I, I think there's a, there's a reasonably large chance. Pro I, I, I'm enough of an optimist to think it's, it's not the uh, it's, it's not the more likely outcome, though sometimes when I think about environmental issues, I, I, I flip on that. But, the, uh, but there, there, there's a reasonably good chance that that, 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 that test will, t will say that we will actually have regressed uh, going forward. Um, and I just also want to say that it's more often than not, people saying everything is at risk right now have been wrong. That's, this, is, this is true. Uh, actually, more of the, um, one of the things that happens when you move academic offices is you clean out your books. And every time I've moved, um, I discover there's a whole bunch of books from uh, 1993 uh, or, uh, or 2005 what it, what, titled something like The Crucial Decade Ahead. <laughs> so there's always, you know, yeah. um, that the... Um, uh, but there have been times uh, uh, when it's, uh, it's gone the other way. And so the uh, uh, famous book by Norman Angel, uh, uh, The Great Illusion, um, published in 1910, um, which is, now, what, what Angel said was, war does not make sense in the modern economy. So that, uh, no, no amount of conquest can possibly be worth the cost of war. Now, he didn't actually predict that there wouldn't be wars, but he was widely read as, as, as saying that. And of course, right on cue comes World War I and, and a, a war on a, a scale of destructiveness no one had, had imagined possible. Um, and I think that's the, but he was, he was making the case for enlightenment values. Let's be rational about this. It doesn't make sense. Um, and kind of hoping, I think, that he would persuade people, which unfortunately he did not. And uh, his point remains true, um, but it doesn't seem to stop uh, stop wars from happening. And it, it takes a lot of work. You know, the the peace that we see, the the uh, something like the you know the peacefulness of modern Europe compared with with the, the terrible first half of the 20th century was not something that evolved automatically or naturally. It required an enormous amount of statesmanship, and uh, you can't always, you know, try to take uh, how many how many statesmen of that caliber do you see uh, in the corridors of power uh, right now? <laughs> for, for fear of fomenting disagreement, I, I, I am curious about a point of distinction in um, Professor Krugman's presentation. Um, the the trajectory of progress versus retrograde seemed to, to, to hinge critically on politics. Um, yet that's a factor that's not necessarily listed in human reason, uh, uh, humanism, science, and reason um, in your emphasis. So I'm curious about oh. how, how you each see the relationship between politics and science. Well, it, it, uh, it very much is in that a, a lot of the political institutions that I think both of us would credit for some of this progress uh, were, uh, were uh, products of uh, ideas, of, uh, some, some of them first broached during the Enlightenment. For example, the uh, post-World War II peace in, in part was a gift of the uh, United Nations and norms against conquest, the uh, immortality of states, the grandfathering of borders, the uh, in increase in trade, as, uh, and as Paul showed, trade uh, uh, decreased after World War I, and uh, the, the outbreak of World War II probably is not, not a coincidence. Uh, all these ideas were, were broached by Immanuel Kant in perpetual peace in the uh, 1790s. So these were, when, when 
policies are uh, sort of motivated by good ideas and then, of course, subject to empirical testing because no one from an armchair can perfectly well predict what's going to work or, or not. When democratic governments in the best sense of democratic, of namely seeing the uh, effects of policy, um, the outcomes on people and adjusting accordingly, then um, the same kind of mindset that goes into science, namely empirically testing your ideas without uh, a priori assurance that they'll be correct, but letting the world um, uh, tell you what works or, or isn't is very much um, enmeshed in politics. But not all of the, and uh, not all of the uh, advances though are political. So for example, the, um, the uh, uh, increasing life expectancy was uh, very much a, a, a product of advances in public health, in the germ theory of disease, in the technology of sanitation, in the invention of artificial fertilizers, in the uh, green revolution of the 60s. So those weren't uh, political, although of course to be fully implemented you need to have the right political uh, infrastructure. Yeah, I, I think that's, technology is, an, is a knowledge is an enabler. And so there, you know, no matter um, how good uh, the, the, the political leadership uh, of, of the world had been in a, in a previous era, it could not have achieved what, where we are now. The, uh, actually, uh, one thing I didn't mention, one, one of the things that appears to be true about the ancient Romans is that they were, they were well nourished, they were prosperous, they were also rather sick. Uh, they, were, they, were, they, they were pretty heavily infested with microbes. Uh, because actually having created a unified trading area that, uh, in the Mediterranean, they've created a pretty good breeding zone for, for microbial diseases. So infectious disease was actually a, a pretty big problem. The Romans were, were, were well-nourished and literate and short. Uh, <laughs> now, did, by the way, are those data on the uh, prosperity of Romans, do they include the slaves? Uh, yeah, was there, there are, there, these yeah. are as, there, as best we can. There, there, were, there were not as many slaves as people think. There were parts of the economy, were, but anyway. They, but I just want to say that, that uh, the point is that the Romans were actually very good at order, and they were actually very good, much better than we are at the moment, at, at you know, carrying out infrastructure investment when it was needed. Um, but they didn't, uh, they didn't know about modern uh, disease theory, so they couldn't... Uh, th had they known about it, they probably would have done a pretty good job of dealing with it. But so, so there's a lot of stuff. There, there's an enabling factor, and this, of course, the, going back to the stuff where I really know what I'm talking about. Uh, clearly, um, global is, global trade is something where you need uh, technologies, and they, they include the and and the advance of knowledge, and it's it's you know, and 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 also not and not just the fancy stuff. You know, we talk about uh, the internet or whatever, but it turns out that the uh, the standardized sized shipping container is a huge driver of, of the way that the world has changed over the past 40 years. Um, those things are make, but the, the point is that politicians or the political system can either uh, create an environment which is favorable for making use of the possibilities that knowledge uh, offers, or it can create an environment that's very unfavorable. And of course, it also somewhat matters whether the political leaders are interested in hearing about truth, facts, science, uh, which again is, is one of the re things that's making me kind of pessimistic these days. You know, I think the, uh, going back to your Rawlsian question projected into the future, and by the way, I, I completely agree that the uh, Rawlsian question is the way to assess progress. And in fact, I, for reasons of time, I actually cut out my own uh, a version of the Rawlsian question from my talk, which I use as an epigraph for the section on progress in the book, and it comes from Barack Obama, who a, a student at, at uh, Harvard, at least in law school, presumably influenced by Rawls, when he said, if you had to pick a moment to be born and you didn't know who you'd be or where you'd be, you'd, you'd uh, choose now. So I think that is the right question. It's a funny question to ask about the year 2050, because what's gonna happen in 2050 very much depends on what we do now and on the results of thousands of conversations such as the one that we're having now. And I, I see the, uh, the, the, the value of, of acknowledging the, the fact of progress in the past, not as saying, well, we can automatically extrapolate lines, because obviously we can't, but it does, uh, go, going forward, as, uh, as we say, uh, what should be our attitude? How do we, since we're going to be bending that curve uh, up, down, or sideways, what do we do to keep it going up? And I, I think the answer is to look at what has pushed it up so far, 
try to do more of that, including in the case of climate change. I have an op-ed coming out in uh, the, the Times on Sunday, that if, uh, assuming that they don't postpone it yet another week, called How to Save the World, uh, in which I and my co-authors, Joshua Goldstein and Stefan Quist, um, identify what I think we ought to do to meet the challenge of uh, climate change. This is not optimism that we will, uh, that we actually will meet the challenge and do what has to be done. Maybe we won't. Uh, I have no idea. I would not place a bet. But, but on the other hand, our challenge now, since we don't know, is not to kind of place bets about what's going to happen in 2050, but to tr argue to do now what will, what would bend the curve in, in the uh, in the right direction. What would solve it, knowing that that is what our successful ancestors did when they did succeed. We have about 25 minutes remaining in our program, and I'd like to leave sufficient time for questions from the audience. There are two microphones in each of the respective aisles. Um, if you're interested, by all means. Start with the left. Thank you. Thank you both for an excellent lecture. Um, at the end of your discussion, Dr. Pinker, you alluded to the fact that uh, we need to be thinking about policies now that for the future in 50 years will provide the greatest benefit to human society. From my perspective as a soon-to-be graduating senior, our politics has shifted in a way, whether in talk, talking about the media, about campaign finance, that encourages politicians to take short-term solutions to long-term problems. Uh, if both of you would be willing to respond with what one thing that we should be looking for in our politics or as individuals in our future society to address this change and to promote more long-term solutions to these problems? Uh, I guess my own um, uh, recommendation would be to distinguish between two mindsets in, term, in terms of how we, we deal with uh, the problems we have now. One of them is that you can blame problems on evil people and the uh, path to progress is to punish and shame and defeat them and make sure that good triumphs over evil. The other is that um, there are problems, there are, have always been problems, uh, it's a, a lack of knowledge that, uh, uh, that, that, that would mean that problems would persist, it's attaining the right knowledge that would mean that we could get out of them. Now neither of them are completely um, viable as political philosophy, sometimes you really do have to uh, oppose people who stand in the way of progress, but I, I tend to think that there is much there's too much of a tendency in both campus and uh, Washington politics to see problems as the malevolent designs of evil people, uh, of course, on both sides, as opposed to um, the result of ignorance and not knowing how to solve our problems. I, I just want to say, I actually disagree with your premise. I do, don't think that the problem we have is that uh, politicians favor short term over long term. Um, what I see, I, there's a lot of bad policies being undertaken, um, but for the most part, they're not being undertaken because people know what they should be doing in the long run, um, but are choosing to do something that is short-sighted instead. They're, being, they're doing the wrong thing because they believe things, or at least pretend to believe things that are simply not true. So it's, it's, it's not uh, the problem that we have on, look, uh, the problem we're having on, it, you might think that the problem we have in coping with climate change is that um, the, the, the costs of, of, of action occur now and the benefits are spread over many future generations. Uh, if only we could get to that point. The problem we're having with climate change is that a uh, sufficiently powerful political blocking uh, coalition has decided that it, it, that it isn't actually a problem, that it's all an invented, that it's a conspiracy on the part of, uh, of socialists or something. And so uh, that's, so that it's not, uh, the, the problem is, is much harder. The problem is, is, not, is, is how to even get uh, science, knowledge, uh, uh, rational thinking into the room. And uh, we're not doing very well at that on, on that issue and quite a few others. Thank you both. Next question. Hi, uh, thank you both for coming today. Um, to continue on the thread of climate change, uh, it seems to me that a lot of the progress, material progress that's been uh, occurred in uh, the West and around the world has been based upon extractive industries uh, that overuse and overexploit certain resources, natural resources and human resources. Um, so I'm wondering if going into the future, is there a way that we can continue to progress uh, in the ways you've both mentioned um, 
without continuing those practices which are causing climate change? Is there a way that we can progress in a way that is truly sustainable and equitable for people? Uh, yeah, there, there is a way, um, although it's, uh, um, uh, it, uh, it doesn't mean that it will happen automatically, but do the laws of physics allow for the resources that we can exploit, that we know how to exploit and we have a reasonable chance of knowing uh, how to, to develop uh, further? afford the kind of lifestyle that we've been enjoying that has underwritten this progress. And you're certainly right that we would not have enjoyed a lot of this progress if we did not have the ability to capture large amounts of energy. And that's probably a common denominator behind all increases in prosperity in the past, that they are fueled to some extent by energy. But it, it is not uh, guaranteed, I mean, it is not irrevocable that the only way to gather energy is by burning carbon. And in fact, there's even been a transition that has occurred in industrialized economies against, uh, away from the most carbon intensive fuel source, namely wood and then coal, to petroleum, which is less carbon intensive, to natural gas, uh, which is still less carbon intensive, to um, uh, renewables and uh, nuclear, uh, which, are, um, uh, which, which have uh, pretty close to zero emissions. Now, and just to give you a preview, I've, I will argue in this uh, op-ed, and I did argue in Enlightenment Now, so it's not a secret, that uh, there is no path that we know of to decarbonizing the world economy while allowing for economic growth in the developing world, in China and India and Indonesia, uh, that does not involve uh, nuclear. I think there's been a lot of uh, irrational opposition to nuclear. I don't think it is just the, I hear, maybe I disagree with, with Paul, I don't think it is just the climate deniers on the right that are impediments to meeting the climate challenge. I think it's also um, the uh, technophobia against um, nuclear power, which is uh, uh, carbon free, and opposition to certain policies that Paul and I both agree on, such as carbon pricing, where it's often the left who uh, oppose carbon pricing as much as the, the, uh, the right. So there, there are impediments on both sides, but the general answer to your question is, yes, energy will be necessary to continue the, our material progress. No, energy does not have to come from burning carbon. Yeah, there, there, is, there is not a tight relationship between BTUs burned and, and real GDP. Uh, there, there is some relationship, there has been historically, but it's one that just in general is, a, is something on which there's a lot of, of room for choice. You can, there are all kinds of decisions that you can make that are going to affect that relationship. So the, the idea that, that uh, economic progress depends upon us consuming ever more energy is actually not right. That, it, they, even in general, we, we could conceivably have an economy that is richer in important ways, which actually uses less energy in total. And, of course, the, the energy doesn't have to come from burning fossil fuels. It certainly doesn't have to come from carbon. Um, and at the moment, we're, as it happens, we're at, a, at a, a kind of inflection point on the technology, which has been turned enormously more favorable to the, the you know, technology is our friend right now in, fight, in fighting carbon change. Um, nuclear, I'm, I'm all for it. Nuclear is, is, is going to be part of the solution, but the idea uh, used to be that that was kind of the only uh, plausible alternative, but now renewables have made so much progress. I mean, we actually are in the situation where, uh, you know, I guess last year, the energy secretary floated a proposal that was basically going to force renewable energy to subsidize coal burning, right? The, the economics have flipped so totally that, 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 um, that coal-powered um, electricity generation, uh, the market wants it to die, and it's, it's going to be political favoritism that keeps it alive. So the, the, the possibilities, uh, this is, it, if we could reach agreement that we, that, that we need to do this, that we need to decarbonize, uh, then the technology is, is pretty much already there. And there would be some economic cost, but the economic, economic cost looks far lower than it did a few years ago. And, um, and yeah, it's, I mean, you know, when Germany shuts down its nuclear plants and, and starts burning coal again, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's really bad, that's done. But, uh, but that's, that's not the core of the problem. The core of the problem is, is actually just convincing people that, look, this, this may not be what you want to hear, but this is real and it's critical. Next question. Um, first of all, thank you for asking my question, so I'll ask something else. Um, 
I am, I used to be very favorable of carbon pricing as well uh, until the riots in France started happening. So I'm not necessarily convinced that artificially raising the price of a good and service we still depend on will prevent people from using it. How do we find the right balance of uh, disincentivizing fossil fuels without making it so that people in poverty can't afford a good and service that we still depend on? Okay. I've actually, uh, the economist. So, look, yeah. I'm for carbon pricing and we're going to have to eventually do it. I mean, it, there, there are a lot of things, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are micro versions of that that happen all the time. Um, uh, we just, the, the, the New York State Legislature just approved congestion pricing for Lower Manhattan. Um, will that hurt some people? Yeah. Uh, or will some of those people be people who uh, are actually not doing that well? Yeah. But it's, it's insane. The, when, when somebody takes a car into, uh, into Lower Manhattan, uh, they're imposing enormous costs on everybody else. And, and so, you, so, but there, there is this economics, uh, uh, there's, there's, I think some of my colleagues call it 101-ism. Uh, people who, who've read their Econ 101 textbook and think that that, that gives all the answers. And Econ 101 says that the, the solution to uh, pollution, the solution to negative externalities, is to put a price on the pollutant. Um, and that is certainly a way, and it's going to be part of the solution, but it's not the only thing to do, it's not the only way, and I'm basically for everything. Uh, uh, the, the, this, this technological progress in renewable energy um, did not happen entirely just out of the blue. Uh, a lot of it has to do with investments that were made under the Ob Obama stimulus plan, which, which provided crucial skills. So investment in new technologies, encouragement, uh, there's a lot of things you can do that, that, that go beyond. Um, and so carbon pricing is going to be part of the solution eventually. Um, it doesn't have to be the centerpiece. Uh, if you do certainly need to think about uh, who you're affecting. Uh, I mean, it, it, what's the, the gilet jaune thing in, in France is not just uh, that Macron imposed carbon pricing, but he simultaneously imposed carbon pricing and also jiggered the tax system in ways that, that favored higher income. He sort of managed to do a, a totally anti-populist program there, which was, uh, I don't know, who he was listening to, but you know, it, it, if you're going to do it, it has to come with a bunch of sweeteners, and that's that's the way to do it. Next question. Um, okay, thank you both, both for coming. Um, my question is, what can we as individuals do to promote pro promote progress to make sure progress happens? Is most we can do um, promote values of science, rationality, and humanism? And if so, how do we fight their opposites, the values of ignorance? populism and segregated societies. Thank you. Well, it, it, indeed, um, uh, it, it doesn't in, involve promoting the values that have led to the progress so far, and uh, in, in particular having a mindset of uh, prioritizing human well-being as the ultimate good, as opposed to national or religious or racial glory. Uh, it involves science in the best sense of trying to explain things and letting the world tell you whether your explanations are, are, are right or wrong, uh, refining reason and not being falling into traps of illusions and biases and fallacies, which we know from cognitive psychology we're uh, prone to when left to our own devices. So it does involve prioritizing education and elevating the quality of discourse in the public sphere, including uh, newspapers and, for that matter, barroom debates. Um, it also, I think, involves the allocation of, of brain power to uh, constructive uses. And I'll, I'll say this at a fellow uh, Ivy School, is that I'm dis often disappointed to see uh, so many smart people go into finance. Not that I don't think we should have a financial se sector. We obviously need one. But uh, I think it's okay for, for some smart people to be in finance, but I'm, I'm disappointed in seeing these really smart students figuring out how to make some very, very, very rich people still even richer, as opposed to uh, figuring out ways uh, of carbon capture and storage, uh, treatment of Alzheimer's disease, treatment of diabetes and obesity, 
uh, in the political realm, figuring out how do you actually implement a policy of carbon pricing with the right kind of rebates so people won't put on yellow vests and, and burn cars and near the Champs on the Champs Elysees. Uh, so it's not just scientific, it's also policy. But, uh, but in an institute of higher education, I would like to see the, some incentives that allocate brain power to where the brain power can be put to best use. Yeah, also, uh, vote, uh, uh, organize, uh, demonstrate, uh, you know, write letters, uh, and actually, and not just to politicians, I think also to other, uh, you know, when, when media organizations uh, uh, do both sides of them on, on, on issues where, in fact, there is, there is truth and falsity, um, they, they should be, people should should write in and complain. I mean, it's a um, my, my experience in the, in the in the media world. Uh, it's still weird to think of myself as part of it, but uh, the uh, um, is that you'd be amazed at how thin-skinned a lot of journalists are. How easily how they are intimidated by criticism. Um, I've, I've developed. I've, I've, I'm a rhinoceros at this point so in terms of that, but the uh, um, and um, and all too often that pressure comes only from one side because it because there are organized groups uh, and uh, so but you can be the other side you can be the one that that chastises uh, both politicians and journalists uh, public figures of any kind for for not taking the side of truth and progress. Next question. Hi, thank you both for speaking today. Um, so today there's more people in the world than ever before and that number is only increasing. And this relates to a lot of things like food production, waste creation, population density, healthcare costs, and so on and so forth. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how like, the growing population could benefit or hinder future progress. <laughs> well, the, um, depending on the uh, projection that you look at, uh, the projection that I've seen that takes into account the effects of education on uh, fertility, namely people with more education have fewer babies, and women's empowerment. Uh, when women are uh, more empowered, they have, they have their first baby later, their la last baby uh, sooner. Um, and the effect of urbanization, people who live in cities have fewer kids. Uh, not only would, will population probably peak around 2070, uh, but we are beginning to see in richer countries, and that's starting to spread to poorer countries, <clears throat> what, what could become population collapses. There's a book called Empty Planet by uh, Ibbotson and uh, 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 Bricker, uh, which pre presents, I think, some plausible demographic data that the, the problem that we may, not, we may face is not overpopulation, which was the nightmare of the uh, 1970s, but rather something closer to what's happening in uh, Japan, where you've got lots and lots of old people being supported by a, a very small number of working uh, younger people. Now, we don't know that for sure. Again, we can't uh, extrapolate with, with certainty. But the, uh, the combination of the peaking population, and as Paul mentioned before, it, it's not a constant that every human being use the same amount of energy as being used today, that with dematerialization, the fact that we have apps that we used to have gadgets uh, doing, the fact that there can be a huge uh, increases in efficiency, getting the stuff that people want with fewer resources, uh, could mean that the population bomb, as it, it was uh, called in 1968, uh, will be diffused. Yeah, basically I agree. That there's, uh, the, the sheer population itself is not the reason to be scared about the, the, the future of the planet. And, the, uh, and, and in fact, um, stagnating or falling uh, working age populations uh, brings problems of its own. Uh, a lot of the trouble in Japan is uh, is that that the number of working age Japanese is declining. You know, more than one percent a year. China working age population appears to have peaked. Uh, um, Europe working age population appears to have peaked. So they uh, and and those bring problems of their own. Uh, so no, I mean the population uh, sounds like it it should be a central issue, but uh, uh, we're we're not. Yeah, we're we're not in 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 a Malthusian world in this in the old sense. We might we might have a different kind of Malthusian crisis involving uh, involving environment and resources, but it's not really about the sheer number of people. Thank you. Next question. 
Hi, um, as everyone else before me said, thank you for your presentations. I actually have a question for Dr. Pinker on your slide about white hostility towards blacks. Um, the data you used talked about, I think, um, whether people were still for discrimination or not, like segregation, and I think that data is a little bit outdated in the forms of racism that are present today, which are not as overt, and I think that discrimination still exists, and we can see that in empirical data, like. Um, in wealth and health, there's huge disparities. So I was just wondering how you feel about the idea that in some ways race, racial issues have made a lot of progress, but in other metrics, they've actually kind of lagged. Yeah, a couple of things. In terms of attitudes, um, every measure, both uh, explicit and implicit, shows that uh, racial prejudice is in decline. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned my colleague Mazarin Banaji and Tessa Charlesworth have shown that even with the subtle uh, instrument called the implicit uh, association test, mm -hmm. where uh, you get associations between, say, negative concepts and uh, uh, African-American and positive and, and uh, white, that that has been in decline. Uh, and that is not just people saying what they know a pollster wants to hear. Uh, I did my own uh, crude measure in Enlightenment now with the help of Seth Stevens Davidovich, looking at the proportion of search for racist jokes on Google. Uh, people in the privacy of their uh, offices or keyboards will search for all kinds of racist material. Uh, and if you look for percentage of, of, of uh, uh, search for racist jokes, it's gone uh, way down. Uh, now, in terms of actual measures, so, so in terms of, uh, despite the appearance that we get, now that internet and social media make it easier for racists to find each other uh, and to, uh, to kind of express ideas that used to be taboo. We have an illusion that racism is going up, whereas in fact, it's, uh, by every measure, it's going down. Now, in terms of racial progress, here too, one has to distinguish the, uh, the, the, the statement, uh, there are no racial problems, with the statement that the problems are not as severe as they used to be. Because uh, it can both be true that there has been progress in the well-being of African Americans and that we are nowhere near where we want to be, namely, it used to be worse. So if you look at, say, the, the ma ma major measures of human well-being, in every one of them there's been spectacular racial progress. In terms of longevity, for example, 100 years ago there was an 18-year gap between uh, whites and blacks, now there's a three-year gap. Now ideally there should be no gap, mm -hmm. but still, 18 to 3 is a big change. In terms of poverty, a century ago, the poverty rate for African Americans was greater than 50%. Now it's less than 25%. Again, that's too high, but 25% is better than 50%. And in terms of literacy, at the turn of the 20th century, 40% of African Americans were illiterate. Now that is, uh, it, it's basically uh, zero. And in terms of happiness, which you could say is the ultimate uh, uh, measure of progress, the happiness of African Americans has been increasing for 50 years. Happiness of white Americans has been uh, uh, pretty stagnant, or in fact, a little bit of a, of a decline. So it is both true that we've made fantastic progress and that problems remain. I just Thank add you. an addendum. To the extent that you have, so you know, we, we still have substantial uh, racism, substantial racial discrimination, uh, almost certainly a lot less than we used to. Um, at the same time, we have rising, um, rising income inequality. And so if you have a society in which tends to relegate people, non-whites, to lower status jobs, lower status occupations, um, and even if the extent to which they are pushed into those positions is less than it used to be, but the gap between those lower status occupations and, and jobs and the better jobs has been growing, you can have a situation in which the income gap can go either way. So there, I, I, there's, I think it, that's overwhelming. We are far less racist. It, it actually, look at polling data. Uh, you've done more of this, but I, looking at polling data from, from the early 1980s, which I still remember pretty well, uh, it's inconceivable how, how blatantly racist we were as a society, and yet because we are also a vastly more unequal society than we were, in some ways racial disparities have failed to narrow. Thank you. Unfortunately